We're going to move on now to the effects of anesthetics on the circulation and show again that the effects of anesthetics on the circulation are remarkably similar, particularly during maintenance of anesthesia, but during other times as well, depending on the concentrations of anesthetic that are delivered. For example, at sub-anesthetic concentrations, the effects of potent inhaled agents or nitrous oxide are fairly minimal. There are changes that occur, some of which are uh, rather interesting. Uh, for example, in the original studies that we did on volunteers given desferrine, we measured the temperature of the toe. Why would we do that? Peripheral vasodilation. We were interested in peripheral vasodilation, just as, as you say. The digits, both those in your fingers and the toes, are very important to temperature regulation. There are shunts within both the toes and the fingers, which allow you to lose or conserve heat, depending on whether they're used or not used. And so we measured, indeed, the temperature in the toe. And we turned the desferrine on. We got to about 2% desferrine. You can see that the toe temperatures went up. This is 26 degrees versus 34, 35 degrees. They really went up a lot, showing the vasodilation at less than a third of mag, a quarter of mag. Uh, that's not unique to desferrine. That would be something that would happen with isofluorine or sevoflurane, any potent inhaled anesthetic. What implications does it have clinically? can lose a large amount of body heat in a very short can, amount of time. Well, you could lose a lot of body heat or transfer body heat from the core to the periphery, which is what Dan Sessler has shown and his group have, have shown. What's the, now you've got to think inside the patient's brain. What's the brain thinking to make that happen? What, what is the brain suddenly thought? Why is it? I'm warm. I'm warm. Yeah, that would be one thought. But in fact, the, the brain is thinking something else. The brain is, uh, we can think like a thermostat. Controls the temperature. It goes down a little bit. What does the body do? Vasoconstrict. You vasoconstrict. If it goes down a little further, what do you do? Shiver. You shiver. And if it goes up, what do you do? Vasodilate. You, you vasodilate first and then you sweat. <laughs> That's right. The other thing you do if the temperature goes down is you put on more clothes. So we maintain the temperature within a very narrow range as we go along here. May depend on the time of day. You get later in the day, the range that we control it at goes up. But it's very narrow, very narrow. And what happens with anesthesia? Reset the set point. Well, that would be one thought. You reset the set point. So you go from there down to there. But in fact, that's not what happens. What happens is that the whole thing broadens. The whole thing broadens. So instead of holding it tight. With anesthesia, it broadens out. And the deeper the anesthesia, the more it broadens. What clinical implications are there other than uh, the fact that you get colder because you transfer heat from the core to the periphery? What else? Clinically, a very simple thing. Can't start? Go ahead. I was just going to say your blood pressure will drop if you vasodilate. So part of it will be vasodilation and a decrease in peripheral resistance, so a blood pressure decrease. Yep. Well, it's just going to change our MAC value. If the temperature drops, that's right. right. It would. Can't start an IV. Can't start an IV. How are you going to do that? How are you going to start an IV? Wait until they're anesthetized. I mean, if you can get an, an, a small IV and get them anesthetized with that and then start another large bore if you need a large bore after they're anesthetized, use the volatile for your benefit. Right. Let's go on to effects of anesthetics at deeper levels. What does uh, maintenance of anesthesia with a potent inhaled agent do to blood pressure? Everybody. Decreases. Decreases. Thank you. There you are. It decreases blood pressure. What does it do to heart rate at deeper levels of anesthesia? Everybody. Increases. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here. Um, 
Dose strain tends to increase it at a lighter level of anesthesia than sevoflurane, but they all, at deeper levels of anesthesia, tend to increase it. What do they do to systemic vascular resistance? Increases. Except for what anesthetic? Halothane. Good. So they decrease systemic vascular re resistance. What do all the anesthetics except halothane do to cardiac index? Everybody say it. No change. Right, they're unchanged. But with halothane, you do get depression of cardiac out output. Now, it gets more complicated when you look over the duration of anesthesia. If you look a long time, we anesthetized volunteers at one and a quarter mac with sevoflurane on one occasion and desferane on another occasion for eight hours of anesthesia. And the blood pressure and heart rate were not constant over eight hours. They changed. They changed. So initially, there was a decrease in heart rate. You see that here? And a greater decrease in blood pressure. And then with time, the heart rate crept up as did the cardiac output. And toward eight hours, the blood pressure crept up. But there was no difference between desferane and sevoflurane. They were identical. This is 9% desferane and 3% sevoflurane. In the previous figures, I didn't note it, perhaps should have, was that there's minimal effect of substituting nitrous oxide for a portion of the anesthetic. What if we change from what I've been showing you here, which is the effects of uh, these potent inhaled agents on volunteers, no surgical stimulation, volunteers with controlled ventilation to volunteers with spontaneous ventilation. What's going to change then? Two things will change, and they are one and two. What's going to change? Gentlemen at the back here. If we change from spontaneous to controlled ventilation, what are we going to change that should influence, or may influence, cardiovascular hemodynamics. You'll have uh, a lower minute ventilation when you go to spontaneous ventilation, and right. lower total anesthetic uptake, and or at least total anesthetic concentration. But we can control that by manipulating the inspired concentration and the delivered concentration. So we can keep the alveolar concentration constant, despite, as you say, the potential effect of an effect on ventilation. What will the decrease in ventilation do to CO2? Increase. And was that going to have a circulatory effect? We'd expect it to, yeah. We would expect it to. Mm -hmm. What else is going to change when we go from controlled ventilation to spontaneous ventilation as far as what happens inside the chest? Uh, venous return. What will happen to venous return? With spontaneous ventilation, we'd have increased venous return. Why will that be? We have negative pressure in the thoracic cavity instead of positive pressure. Right. So both of those would suggest that things like cardiac output would go up, right? Yes. And peripheral resistance might go down. For what reason? I'm not sure. OK. What should CO2 do directly to the vessels in any tissue? Vasodilate. Peripheral resistance should go mm -hmm. down. OK. And that's what happens. You can see more details in the book when you, when you read that. I'm going to go on to what MAC bar is and MAC intubation is, MAC IT. Again, let's have the definition. What, what was, what's MAC bar? MAC bar is uh, where you basically have blunting of your autonomic responses, 50% of people. Right. Blockade of the autonomic response. That's the bar part of this. And MAC intubation is the concentration uh, at which you get suppression of the response to pre placement of a tracheal tube. The MAC bar may differ among the anesthetics. The differences aren't great. It appears that MAC bar is greater for sevoflurane than for desferane or isoflurane. But uh, these haven't really been compared in the same studies. Um, we're going to look at a couple of examples of MAC bar in terms of the cardiovascular response to surgical stimulation now. Let's see what they are. James, we have a relatively healthy patient today for lumbar laminectomy, and we're about to start the incision. Um, we're on a concentration of desferane of, uh, what, two-thirds max? What yes. else have we done today? We've also 
added nitrous oxide at half MAC, and we're currently running oxygen at about 50%. Okay, we've given no narcotics. We've given no narcotics. We've given some benzodiazepine sedation. Yes. And we're at steady state now. Our blood pressure is 105 over 70. Heart rate is stable at, we'll wait for this interference, 52. And we've been stable for about 10 minutes, correct? Yes, sir. The surgeons are ready to make their incision. We'd like to demonstrate the effect of the surgical stimulation on blood pressure and heart rate. And then we'll change our desferrin concentration by increasing it after we see a hemodynamic response. Correct. And then we'll see how long it takes to recover. Correct. James, Dr. Kelly's making the incision now. Again, we've been at steady state heart rate of 52. Blood pressure of now 116 over 70 prior to incision. And it's been uh, seven minutes now since the incision, and we've been watching the hemodynamics. There really has been a minimal change. What did you notice? Uh, well, we've actually made no changes with our volatile agents, and we've maintained uh, heart rate and blood pressure within an adequate range. There's All right, right change. now we're at 122 over 85. Uh, we've come up from 116 over 70 and uh, really the trend has been unremarkable. Mm -hmm. James, it's been 12 minutes now since the incision and we're starting to note some changes. Can you tell us what's happening? Uh, yes, we are starting to see a slight increase in heart rate and the blood pressure has gone up from 116 over 70 to 135 over 89. There's been no local used in the incision as well. Okay, so then we could attribute <coughs> this to the surgical stimulation. Yes. What would you like to do about it? Uh, well, I'd like to double the concentration of desflurane and see if we can come back to a All right, we're at an end tidal of uh, 3.8. Why don't we just overpressurize a bit? And why don't we also increase our flows, perhaps to 2 and 2. James, our dial has been on 9%, and we see that our end tidal concentration has increased now up to 7.3. Tell us what's happened. Well, as we've increased our MAC uh, nearing MAC bar, we can see that our heart rate has come back down to 61 and our blood pressure is almost exactly what it was prior to incision. Okay, we have another one cycling right now. Let's see what this one is. Uh, noting that indeed it's only been three minutes now since we increased the dial, mm -hmm. okay? But we've been at uh, an end tidal for no more than uh, one minute or so. And here again, our blood pressure is 114 over 82. So we have restored the blood pressure very quickly uh, back to its normal values in approximately two minutes. This morning we anesthetized a patient with desferrin and we used a low flow rate, one liter per minute, 4% desferrin and 50% nitrous oxide. And we saw what the cardiovascular response was to incision, lumbar laminectomy. Tell me what we're doing with this patient that might be different. We're duplicating the, sec the technique, but we've substituted with sevoflurane. We still have a one liter flow. We have an entitled sevoflurane concentration of 1.2 and a 50% oxygen nitrous mixture. And what does that produce in the cardiovascular responses or the cardiovascular status? Currently, our blood pressure is 93 over 58 with a heart rate of 79. Okay, and we're going to have uh, an incision shortly. Yes, sir. And we're going to see how the blood pressure and pulse rate respond. Yes. And compare that to what happened with this ring. Correct. Sounds good. Sounds Let's good. see what happens. Okay. It's now two minutes after incision has been made. What do you see? There has been a sympathetic response. Her heart rate is up to 90, and our blood pressure has increased to 111 over 68. Okay, let's see what happens at five minutes, just as we did in the previous case with desferrin. Has the cardiovascular system changed anymore? No, actually, the heart rate still remains above 90, and the blood pressure has not returned to baseline. All right, let's see if we can make it return to baseline by doubling the vaporizer concentration. Tell us what you're doing. I'm going to double the vaporizer concentration to 3.2. And we're going to give that, just as we did this morning, a couple minutes to do its magic. Yes, sir. Okay. Our entitled concentration currently is 1.6. And we have had somewhat of a decrease in our heart rate, but the blood pressure is still at 112 over 69. Actually, the heart rate's al almost back to the control level, isn't it? Yes. Well, let's give it another few minutes and see what that does. Now it's 
five minutes after we turn the sebo farin up. And what's happened now? Well, our vital signs have returned to baseline. Our blood pressure is now 96 over 64. As you recall, our baseline was 92 over 60, and the heart rate is 78. Our baseline was 77. So the sebo farin has been quite effective in returning the cardiovascular signs back to where they were. So there wasn't, even, wasn't much to compare between those two. They, they both allowed a, an autonomic response to the stimulus of surgery. And in both, the autonomic response was limited, not bad. And in both, it appeared to be attenuated, ultimately, by raising the anesthetic concentration to above MACBAR. We've seen two demonstrations of MACBAR. We've seen that two anesthetics, desferane and sevoflurane, do not suppress, do not prevent the cardiovascular response to the stimulation of surgery. We've seen that in the absence of fentanyl, these two anesthetics are not perfect analgesics. Now, if we add fentanyl, we should change those dynamics because fentanyl synergistically decreases MACBAR. And we can see that in this slide, which shows that MACBAR as a fraction of sevoflurane MAC in children decreases dramatically with what are reasonably small doses of fentanyl. So it decreases from maybe 1.04 times MAC down to well under MAC. This parallels the effect on MAC itself, doesn't it? Fentanyl acts synergistically to decrease MAC. It acts synergistically to decrease MAC bar. Let's see the use of fentanyl to treat the cardiovascular response to the stimulus. We've so induced we anesthesia with some propofol, and we've maintained anesthesia with desferane at uh, 6%. They've begun their procedure, and we notice that the pulse rate and blood pressure have done what? Basically, we've got an increase in blood pressure up to 177 over 116. And we've got an increase in heart rate to 121 since what? incision. Why does that happen? Basically, we have given minimal narcotics, and we have surgical incision. And desflurane is a very poor analgesic agent. OK, so what should we do? We can give some more fentanyl. All right, let's do that. Let's yeah. give some fentanyl. And you're going to give how much? I'm going to give 150 mics fentanyl. OK. There it goes. OK, we've given 150 mics of fentanyl. What's that done? Basically, it's brought our blood pressure down to 110 over 78. And it's brought our heart rate down to 56. What does that tell you about how analgesic, or how much analgesia death brain supplies? Basically, it tells us it probably doesn't give very much. Doesn't give very much. Does it? Okay, just like all potent inhaled anesthetics. They're not very good analgesic aid. Okay? MAC bar is uh, considerably above MAC itself. So is the MAC for tracheal intubation. So the MAC IT is well above uh, MAC itself, or it can be. And the anesthetics may not act equally to suppress the response to tracheal intubation. So the arterial blood pressure at 2 MAC after tracheal intubation in healthy adult patients may go up much more with sevoflurane than it does with halothane or isoflurane. Now, this may be artifactual, artifactual in the sense that can we maintain 2 MAC? In which anesthetics are we apt to maintain 2 MAC better, particularly if the patients are breathing spontaneously? The more soluble ones. So maybe this simply reflects a difference in the amount of anesthetic that remains. And with poorly soluble agents, you may expect to see a greater re response than with the more soluble anesthetics. Now we're going to turn to a different topic, which is differences among anesthetics in the response to induction of anesthesia, particularly at concentrations exceeding MAC. And the um, study that prompted all this was a study by uh, Ebert. Ebert observed that with desferane, going from 1 mac to 1.5 mac, you got cardiovascular stimulation. But if you did the same thing with sevoflurane, you got only cardiovascular depression. And this is from his work. Tom Ebert showed that the heart rate, when you increased the vaporizer setting from 1 mac to 1.5 mac, 
The heart rate went up, and then it came back down again, all in the space of perhaps eight minutes or so. With sevoflurane, there was a progressive decrease in the heart rate, a difference now between desferane and sevoflurane, where before, during maintenance of anesthesia, we saw no difference at all. Let's look at this in uh, the operating room, showing the effect of so doubling desferrain from 6 to 12 percent with no premedication with fentanyl. What we want to do is to increase our desferrain concentration anticipating the incision. So okay. why don't we double our dial okay. concentration from 6 to 12 percent. 12 percent there. And with a fresh gas flow of 6 liters per minute, we have a relatively favorable time constant for the washing of desferrain. So if we draw our attention here to the inspired, notice how very quickly the inspired concentration of desferrain is rising. Immediately in just two cycles, we've gone from six to 11 and approaching 12% on the dial. And because of the relative insolubility of desferrain, I think we're gonna see a very rapid uh, equilibration in FA over FI, aren't we? That's correct. Can you predict anything that might occur with this uh, rapid increase in desferrain, noting the hemodynamics? Well, the patient had previously leveled off with a pulse rate in the 50s and a blood pressure in the 130s, systolic over 60s. Uh, we might see more of a hyperdynamic state in which the pulse rate and the blood pressure transiently increase. I would expect that to take a few minutes. Well, I think we're beginning to see it now, actually. Notice the pulse rate has increased approximately 10 beats a minute over yes. the last 30 seconds. Now, there's been no surgical stimulation, is that correct? That's correct. Oh, look at the, what is this here? Well, our blood pressure is increasing to go along with the increase in the pulse rate. And look at this. Well, this is exactly what we had predicted would happen, isn't it? That's very consistent with a rapid increase in desferrain. So let, let's just notice here that our desferrain has gone from 6 to 9.4% end tidal in just 60 seconds while we're talking. And we've had an increase of, a dramatic increase in blood pressure and a, a heart rate that has gone up over 60% in just 60 seconds. That's correct. All right, if we continue to watch this, what do you predict will happen? Uh, over about 10 to 15 minutes, the patient will gradually return to their baseline, barring any surgical stimulus. And if this was undesirable, how could we attenuate the effects of desferrain on blood pressure and heart rate? Well, we could premedicate the patient with opioids, anticipating the rapid change in desferrain. Uh-huh. So we've given no opioid, have we? This cardiovascular stimulation that we've seen is mediated by rapidly adapting receptors that are mainly, although not exclusively, in the arterial systemic circulation. <clears throat> the um, rapid adaptation is shown by the fact that the blood pressure increase and the heart rate increase go up and then come down within the space of about four to six minutes normally. It can also be shown in another way, and this was shown by Dick Weisskopf, Weisskopf looked at this increase that occurs with a step change in alveolar concentration, in this case from 4 to 8 percent, within the space of one minute, usually about 30 seconds. You see this dramatic increase in blood pressure, which returns to control levels six minutes after the start. What was even more interesting was Weisskopf's study then had the alveolar concentration brought back to 4 percent held for another 30 minutes, and then increased a second time to 8%. And look at the absence of any really meaningful change in the blood pressure. Did it a third time, and again, no meaningful change. So these receptors that mediate whatever this response is rapidly adapt to the higher concentration of desferrin. There can be minimization or elimination of this response to increasing concentrations of desferrin by one of several things. One can never go above 6%. If you never go above 6%, not a problem. Or you can go above 6% doing it very slowly, although there's a limit to how effective that approach is. Or, as was suggested in the film you saw a moment ago, you can give some fentanyl. And we're going to show you, with a little film here, the effect of uh, 
doubling death you know, rate from yeah, six to twelve percent on the vaporizer. The after, in this case, premedication with fentanyl. If it does, having given some opioid, what's the blood pressure and heart rate now? Our blood pressure is ninety over sixty-six, when our heart rate is fifty-seven. Okay. All right. Let's turn the death rate from where it is now. Where is it now? It's at six percent. Okay. And let's go to twelve percent. Okay, and that's with a what flow of oxygen? That's at five liters per minute of oxygen. Okay. All right, let's see what that does. Okay, Jennifer, it's been two minutes since we increased the concentration to 12%. What's happened? Basically, we've seen a small increase in blood pressure to 118 over 76, a slight increase in heart rate to 72. That's less than it was before we gave the fentanyl, isn't it? That's right. She was 120 when we gave it. Okay. And that's despite the fact that the concentration of desferrin is at 12% on the vaporizer. And where is it? Still at 12%. Still 12%. And how about on the monitor? On the monitor, we're reading an end title of 10 and an inspired of 11.1. .1. So what's the fentanyl done to her cardiovascular response to desferrin? It's blunted the cardiovascular response. It's blunted. It's a 10. And that blunting has been shown in several studies, uh, studies by Tom Ebert, studies by Weisskopf, such as uh, this one. One where uh, you see the original increase in heart rate or blood pressure without premedication, and then uh, half that if you give 1.5 mics per kilo of fentanyl, and even less if you give higher doses of fentanyl. So you can minimize this cardiovascular response by giving a bit of opioid. So we think sevoflurane gets off scot-free. Not quite. Not quite. Um, if you give high concentrations of sevoflurane, there is an opposite effect uh, that is of potential concern in children. Our concern in children is much less an increase in heart rate. It's a concern in, in adults because of the potential for cardiovascular disease, particularly coronary artery disease. But in children, our concern is bradycardia. Our concern is bradycardia because protection of cardiac output requires a sustained heart rate in children, more than in adults. And high concentrations of sevoflurane for induction of anesthesia in children can produce profound bradycardia not very often. But when it occurs, it's of concern. So be aware of that, and be aware that you can manage it by rapidly decreasing the concentration of sevoflurane. OK, which of the inhaled anesthetics is arrhythmogenic as far as ventricular arrhythmias is concerned? What about the other anesthetics? Zero concern. Give as much epinephrine as you like. Use in a uh, case for elimination of a pheochromocytoma. Uh, what about the arrhythmias that are induced by an acute myocardial infarction? Experimentally, what do anesthetics like desferrin and halothin and sevoflurane do? Diminish them. What about if you've got an increased QT interval? Is there one anesthetic that might be of concern? SIVO. So if you've got an increased QT interval, a very slow heart rate, to be a little bit more careful in the use of sevoflurane. What effect do the potent inhaled anesthetics have on baroreflexes? Everybody. What do they do to baroreflexes? They, they blunt them or decrease them. Now, one of the interesting questions is, are, are the potent inhaled anesthetics a friend or a foe to the heart that has compromised circulation? We've got a study uh, that looked at this, uh, one of the early studies with Desferrin. This was the Hellman study, published in Anesthesiology, and got a lot of controversy. This was a study of 200 patients with coronary artery disease. And they, we knew they had coronary artery disease because they were all they have a bypass graft. In fact, several bypass grafts. Half of them were anesthetized with desferrin and half with sufentanil. Now, those who got desferrin got 10% for induction of anesthesia. What do you suppose that might do to the circulation? They would become hyperdynamic. So you have an increase in heart rate, blood pressure. 
and blood pressure. What might that do in terms of the appearance of ischemia? Heighten it. Would heighten the appearance of ischemia. OK, and that's what they found. They found a greater incidence of ischemia on induction with desferrin than with sufentanil, significantly. But then they found this, a more severe ischemia during maintenance with sufentanil. And that was significant, too. Less severity of ischemia during maintenance, and no difference between the groups in outcomes. No difference in mortality, no difference in myocardial infarction, no difference in uh, things like the need for significant support of the circulation. What about this greater ischemia during maintenance with sufentanil? Is that really an increase with sufentanil, or does it reflect a protection against myocardial ischemia with uh, desferrin? In fact, uh, there is considerable evidence uh, that suggests that we can get protection from the inhaled anesthetics. We, kn we know that you can get, using the inhaled anesthetics in experimental models, you can get enhanced contractile recovery after myocardial vessel inclusion. You can get a decreased infarct size from occlusion by the use of potent inhaled anesthetics. You can protect against reperfusion injury. And these compounds may act similarly to mimic ischemic preconditioning of the heart. You all know what that is? Make the heart ischemic, and it's less vulnerable to subsequent episodes of ischemia. It's preconditioned. As far as the infarct size, uh, the studies that have been done in animals uh, suggest that desferrin has a greater effect, more protective effect, than propofol or isoflurane or sevoflurane. And that may be what we're seeing in this differential in the Hellman study. Desferrin may be protecting the heart, not that sufentanil is hurting it. I should add that for several studies comparing the various inhaled anesthetics among themselves or with opioid approaches to anesthesia, there is no difference, though, in outcomes in patients who are at risk of coronary artery disease. So they all are about the same. Now, another thing you should know about, and was of considerable controversy a while ago, was something called coronary steel. How can you steal a coronary? What is coronary steel? What is it? Well, coronary steel referred to uh, vasodilation of basically normal, normal, healthy coronary arteries. And you would actually shunt or divert blood flow from the stenotic areas and have a result in ischemia. OK. Would you agree with that, Tracy? Yes, and it's the stenotic areas that are receiving collateral flow. Right. So you've got to add that dimension to it. And in fact, it's even more complicated than that. So we got a, we got a vessel coming down a coronary artery, and it's got a, an occlusion, not an occlusion, a stenosis. But it isn't, it isn't a bad stenosis. And this vessel goes to a bed here. And from this vessel, or from the bed, we have some collateral vessels going to an area that's just getting barely enough to stay alive. Now we give our isoflurane or desferrin or sevoflurane, and we cause vasodilation in the normal bed. Because there is a partial obstruction here, what's that going to do to the blood pressure here? Lower. Decrease. It'll lower it. It'll decrease it. And by decreasing it, it may compromise the collateral flow. It may steal blood from here to here. And that was suggested by Sebastian Reese in a study that he did of isoflurane, a study in which he gave patients with known coronary artery disease isoflurane. <coughs> and he found that he got vasodilation of the coronary arteries, and he found that he got ischemia, myocardial ischemia. Did that prove that there was coronary steel? No. What he also failed to do was keep the blood pressure from going down. What would happen if the blood pressure went way down? What would happen to coronary vascular resistance? Would decrease with autoregulation. Vessels would open up. If the blood pressure went way down and you had 
stenotic vessels, what would that do to perfusion of the myocardium? Decrease. It would decrease it. Chances of producing myocardial ischemia are therefore increased. So what he did was he showed indeed that there was vasodilation, but it probably did not have to do as much with the anesthetic as it had to do with the fact that he got hypotension. And the myocardial ischemia similarly probably was unrelated to the anesthetic, was related to the hypotension. Subsequent studies of coronary steel have suggested that there really isn't an important issue with any of the potent inhaled anesthetics. Finally, let's talk about regional blood flow. We talked about pulmonary blood flow when we talked about hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. What about the heart? What, in general, is the effect of uh, the inhaled anesthetics on resistance to blood flow through the heart? Lowers it and decreases. It decreases, tends to decrease resistance. In fact, the anesthetics tend to decrease resistance through all tissues. Now, Sometimes this doesn't become evident because there's a concurrent effect that anesthetics have on all tissues. What do anesthetics <coughs> do to tissues that's going to indirectly influence vascular resistance? Lower their metabolic rate. Say it louder. Lower what it's going to do? Lower their metabolic rate. So if it lowers their metabolic rate, what should that do to resistance? What well, decreases their CO2 production, decreases right. their lactate production, that all that tends to lower their um, vascular resistance. Lower it or raise it? Increase. I'm sorry, increase. It would increase resistance. And the fact that you sometimes see no change in the face of that uh, suggests that resistance is decreased or would tend to be decreased. You see increases in the oxygen, in the venous blood leaving almost all tissues. So we have a tendency to a decrease in resistance, a tendency to sustained or even increased flow in some beds, uh, particularly the brain, for example. We have a change in autoregulation. What's autoregulation? For example, what's cerebral autoregulation? What does that mean? Who, who wants to volunteer? We got several volunteers. Let's see, we haven't talked to you for a while. Within a given set point of range of blood pressures, uh, the, uh, the vascular beds either constrict or vasodilate to maintain that certain pressure within a wide range of blood pressures. Ma maintain blood flow. That's within correct. A, within a wide, wide range. That's exactly right. A very nice description. What, uh, what happens to autoregulation when we give an inhaled anesthetic, a potent inhaled anesthetic? So we, we, well, let, me, let me just draw what you've just said. This is blood pressure, and this is uh, cerebral blood flow. Uh, we've got a range over which cerebral blood flow doesn't change despite change in blood pressure. And then you get below a certain level, and what happens to blood flow? Decreases. Decreases. It goes down. <coughs> and you get above a certain point. Increases. It will increase. What are these, what are these limits here and here? About what numerically? 50. Yeah, about 50 and about 150. Okay. Now, what does anesthesia do to that? It increases it or raises it. It raises the whole thing. That's right. And in fact, it, it does this. So it narrows the range over which autoregulation occurs. There is the belief that we shouldn't go below 50 because we lose autoregulation, and it's, uh, the, the autoregulation is telling us that tissues are suffering. Does that mean you can't go below 50 without causing a cerebral infarct? Quinn is shaking his head, no. Well, not necessarily. If, if you gave them barbiturates or some other method of cerebral protection, you could go below 50. What about inhaled anesthetic? If they're found to be protective, that might have a, a factor in letting you go lower than you would ordinarily. Well, that concludes our discussion of the circulatory effects of inhaled anesthetics. Any questions? <laughs>